help me. I'm Amanda Berry. I've been missing for 10 years, and I'm, I'm here. I'm free now. This is the story of three girls who, in two years, all went missing from the same street. Michelle Knight, 21, kidnapped August 2002. Amanda Berry, almost 17, kidnapped April 2003. And Gina De Jesus, aged 14, kidnapped April 2004. Until May 2013, they were held captive inside this house by a 52-year-old school bus driver and musician. His name, Ariel Castro. We found them. We found them. So who is the man who held the girls captive in a busy urban neighbourhood for 10 years? And how did he remain undetected? I'm Rick Edwards. I've come to the United States to meet the people who live close to Ariel Castro. His mother will come to see him. He would check her out from the porch or come and talk to her and he won't let her in the house. I go inside the hospital to hear from the medical team who treated the girls. I did notice that the girls wanted to be together. So every time we would like kind of separate them, they would come search for each other. Inside 2207 Seymour Avenue, what Castro told a friend who heard strange noises upstairs. And I asked him, what is these noises coming from? And they said, he said that he had some dogs. And inside the Castro family, why they want to meet the daughter he fathered in captivity. She's our cousin. She's our blood. And I want her to know that she doesn't have monster in her blood. So why did nobody know that this ordinary house in this ordinary street was actually a prison? I've come to speak to the people here in the US city of Cleveland to find out what really happened. This is a miracle. This does not happen. People do not come out alive out of this. This is Cleveland, Ohio in the United States, a city that I know very little about. This area, downtown, looks nothing like the Cleveland that I've seen depicted in recent press coverage. It feels like a shiny, friendly American city. And yet somewhere very near here, three young women were held in a house captive for 10 years and subjected to unimaginable horrors, horrors that we don't even know the details of yet. It's hard to believe, it's hard to comprehend, and want to find out more. It's around 5.45 p.m., May the 6th, 2013, a sunny spring evening on Seymour Avenue on Cleveland's west side. This is a neighborhood of mainly first-generation immigrants on low incomes. Aurora Marty from Puerto Rico is sitting outside when she hears shouts from the house over the road. With her son's present, she tells what happens next. We were talking. When we hear a shout, I looked in front of the house and it was Amanda Berry shouting for help with her hand like this. She could poke her arm through a gap in the door. The door was chained shut so I couldn't really see her. She did this and said, help me, my name is Amanda Berry. Amanda's shouts are also heard by another neighbor, Charles Ramsey. I meet my McDonald's, I uh, come outside, I see this girl going nuts trying to get out of her house. So I go on the porch. I go on the porch and she says, help me get out. I've been, I'm, I've been in here a long time. So, you know, I figured it's a, a domestic violence dispute. My neighbor Angulo went over there and kicked the hole in the door. Then they broke the chain. There was another part that Angulo broke and she was able to get out. Both of them were screaming. At 5.48, another neighbor's mobile phone captures the scene. Amanda Berry is out of the house and carrying a small child. And she comes out with the little girl and she says, call 911. My name is Amanda Berry. Help me, I'm Amanda Berry. You need police, fire, or ambulance? I need police. Okay, and what's going on there? I've been kidnapped and I've been missing for 10 years and I'm, I'm here, I'm free now. Man, I'm calling the 911 for Amanda Berry? I thought this girl was dead. You know what I mean? Okay, and what's your address? Uh, 2207 Seymour Avenue. 
But the drama isn't over yet. 2207 Seymour Avenue is owned by a man named Ariel Castro. He's gone out, but could return any moment. We're going to stop him as soon as we get a car open. No, I need them now before we get them back. All right, we're sending them, okay? Okay. I felt really scared he was going to come back and there was nothing I could do. He always came and went. My neighbor shouted to me, grab them and bring them inside or he'll kill us. Okay, stay there with those neighbors and talk to the police when they get there. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, talk to the police when they get there. We're sending them, okay? Okay. Who's the guy who went out? Um, his name is Ariel Castro. All right, how old is he? Uh, he's like 52. <laughs> All right, and... Uh, Steven, I'm Amanda Berry. I've been on the news for the last 10 years. Okay, I got I got that with here. Marina. I already... <laughs> and uh, you said, what was his name again? Uh, Ariel Castro. And is he white, black, or Hispanic? I ain't Hispanic. And what's he wearing? I don't know, because he's not here right now. That's when, he he left, away. When, when he left, what was he wearing? Too young, it's a pity. What? The police are on the way. Talk to them when they get there. Okay. I need. Okay. I told you they're on the way. Talk to them when they get there. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Bye. At 5:52, the dispatcher calls in a squad car. I have a call pick on the phone with a female who says her name is Amanda Berry and that she had been kidnapped 10 years ago. She's at this location now. She's saying that the male is Ariel Castro, 52-year-old Hispanic male that lives at 2207 Seymour and that he's been holding her here for 10 years. Adam 23, you got a boss coming? This might be for real. At 5.55, a neighbor's phone records police breaking into 2207 Seymour Avenue. The police arrived. She ran over and hugged them. They straight away put her inside the police car. And when she was inside the car, she told them there were two more women. See, the girl Amanda told the police, I ain't just the only ones. It's some more girls up in that house. <laughs> we found them. We found them. Georgina Days. We also have a Michelle Knight in the house. I don't know if you want to look that up in the radio, uh, the system. 32 years old. And when they came out, it was just astonishing because I thought they were going to come up with nothing. So they brought the other two out and took them to hospital. The other two girls were naked. They brought him down wrapped in blankets. He had him up there chained, naked. So Paul, talk me through the sequence of events for you on May the 6th, the evening. I, I just had gotten home from work. It was about uh, 14 minutes after 6. And I got a phone call from somebody highly placed telling me that they had found uh, Gina and Amanda. And uh, my reaction was, was shocked that they had been found. But then he said, and a third girl. And a third girl. I said, there's another body? He said, no, alive. And I was dumbfounded. At 6 p.m., a call goes out to trace Ariel Castro. At 6.16, police track him down. We've got Ono Castro and Ariel Castro in custody down here at uh, McDonald's. You know, the, the neighbors say they had no idea whatsoever. Uh, they, they are absolutely stunned. They described this man as very friendly. He'd come out to get his mail. He would chat and, and strike up conversation. But they never saw any of the young women. They never even suspected whatsoever. Um, but right now, here on Seymour Avenue, there's incredible joy here in this neighborhood. Hundreds of news crews descend on Seymour Avenue. Normal programming is suspended. Live coverage takes over from night to next morning. Good morning. Just a half a block away from suspect Ariel Castro's home, his uncle, who works at this convenience store, we spoke exclusively to Julio Castro about his nephew to get his family's reaction. Two days after the three women are found, Ariel Castro is charged with four counts of kidnapping and three counts of rape. Bail is set at $8 million. He does not enter a plea. Charges against Mr. Castro are based on premeditated, deliberate, and depraved decisions to snatch three young ladies from uh, Cleveland's west side streets. 
to be used in whatever self-gratifying, self-serving way uh, he saw fit. Um, with respect to Mr. Castro, he is waiving examination on each case. With respect to bond on Mr. Castro, Mr. Castro is 52 years old. He has lived in the area for 39 years. He is on unemployment compensation. And to the best of my knowledge, he has no convictions for felonies or serious misdemeanors. So what did really happen all those years ago here in Cleveland? And why did it take more than 10 years to find three young women, two of them teenagers, who were snatched off the street and kept captive in a residential house? Let's start at the beginning. Michelle Knight was last seen here on the corner of Lorraine Avenue and West 106th Street on August the 22nd, 2002. Less than a year after that, and just four blocks that way, at West 110th Street, again on Lorraine Avenue, Amanda Berry was last seen. That was on April the 21st, 2003. Less than a year after that, on April the 2nd, 2004, Gina De Jesus was seen at that phone box on the corner of West 105th Street and Lorraine Avenue. All Lorraine Avenue. It seems that Ariel Castro took all of these girls from the same street. When the first of the three captives goes missing, there's no publicity. The victim is Michelle Knight. It's August the 22nd, 2002. Michelle is 21. She's last seen at her cousin's house, near West 106th Street and Lorraine Avenue. Her grandmother recalls for me the events of the day. When we first realized when um, she didn't come home one day, I guess she had went to the store or something over 106th, and she never came back. And we just thought that maybe she had, you know, walked to somebody's house, house to visit, so we didn't take no mind to it until her mother had called the police and they said they couldn't do nothing about it for 48 hours or something until they know if she's missing or not. We kept looking for her, run, walking around, putting stuff on like the poles, putting up flyers. Michelle Knight's life was hard. She'd reportedly been assaulted at school and dropped out at 17 because she was pregnant. Her child was taken away by social services just before she disappeared. Her missing persons report filed by her mother shows Michelle is wearing blue shorts and a white t-shirt. She has mental abnormalities and is often confused by her surroundings. Her nickname is Shorty. At what point did you feel that you might never see Michelle again? Well, it took me, i say, pretty much about nine months, I would say. I started kind of giving up hope Yet my heart was saying that she was still out there someplace. After 15 months, the police take Michelle off the missing persons list. To all intents and purposes, Michelle Knight has vanished off the face of the earth. But by this time, Ariel Castro has struck again. The victim is Amanda Berry. It's April the 21st, 2003, the day before her 17th birthday. Amanda's heading home from her evening shift at Burger King on Lorraine Avenue. She calls her sister to cancel her lift. Someone else is driving her home. Originally, it was thought that Amanda had run away from home. Then a week later, a call was made from Amanda's mobile phone to her mother. The caller said that Amanda was fine and that she'd be coming home in a couple of days. The police and the FBI conclude that Amanda wasn't a runaway she was a missing person. People can sit back and say, oh, this will never happen to my child. Well, guess what? It happened to my niece. Amanda's disappearance is big news. Her family, led by her mother, Luana Miller, does everything possible to keep people looking for Amanda. Her mother even agrees to go on television to ask a TV psychic if Amanda is alive. Before an audience, she's told her daughter is dead. So you don't think I'll ever see her again? Yeah, in heaven, on the other side. I can't understand why she's such a good girl. Investigators dug into a prisoner's tip. Nothing of evidentiary value, nothing found in the dirt at all. 
Cleveland police still don't know where Amanda Berry is, but they know where she isn't. And for her family tonight, that's enough. Day by day, I just think either she's going to come home or one day I'm going to find my peace. Almost a year later, the third captive is taken. It's April the 2nd, 2004. Gina De Jesus, aged 14, is on her way home from school. She's at the junction of West 105th Street and Lorraine Avenue. A car pulls up. She recognises the driver as Mr Castro, the father of one of her friends. Castro offers Gina a lift home. Her family realise something's wrong when she isn't home at her usual time. Gina's reported missing. One of the most uncomfortable facts about this story is that the De Jesus and Castro families know each other well. Nancy Ruiz, Gina's mother, grew up with Ariel Castro in the same neighbourhood. When Gina's family held vigils for their daughter, Castro would play music, dedicate songs to her and hug Gina's mother. He also joined searches and handed out flyers. With two teenagers disappearing from the same neighbourhood in less than a year, people are angry and demanding action. Volunteers publicise appeals for Amanda and Gina, but Cleveland TV reporters fear the worst. Gina and Amanda are about a year apart. Uh, that Something's wrong, something doesn't add up here because coming home from school, working at a Burger King, these are not bad kids. Uh, and the proximity of you know, a couple of blocks apart it, it, it just didn't end up, so that's why I think these two cases got such attention uh, from the media. It didn't necessarily help. If you see it, say it. On April the 22nd this year, two weeks before the discovery, local TV marks the 10th anniversary of Amanda Berry's disappearance. If she is still alive, tomorrow will be Amanda Berry's 27th birthday. The 17-year-old disappeared walking home from work, which was at this Burger King on West 110th and Lorraine. A decade's worth of investigation drummed up lots of leads, but no real answers here. But someone does have the answer. He's the man who kidnapped Michelle, Amanda and Gina and drove them three miles away to his ordinary-looking house, where they've been captive for ten years. His name is Ariel Castro. So who is Ariel Castro? And how was he able to maintain a job, a social life, be a member of this community, yet keep three women hidden in his house for so long? From his Facebook page, he just looks like an ordinary guy. 28 friends, just a catalogue of banal posts, some of which seem sinister or loaded in retrospect, but. Miracles really do happen. God is good. He posted four days before the girls were found. He shared a post which reads, A real woman will not use their child as a weapon to hurt the father when the relationship breaks down. Do not lose sight of the fact that it's the child that suffers. He said, true that. This morning I woke up to the sound of a chirping cardinal. Yes, come on spring. Actually, all totally innocuous. But then why wouldn't they be? He's hardly going to write something incriminating. It occurs to me that, in fact, social media provides the perfect opportunity for someone like this to present an artifice of normality. It seems that no one suspected the man who played bass in a local salsa band. Ariel Castro was also protected by his family's reputation. The Castros are said to be pillars of the Puerto Rican community in Cleveland's west side. His cousin Maria Montes agreed to speak to me. She describes Ariel Castro's immediate family as tight-knit. How close were you to Ariel? Um, well, we were very close when we were younger. Um, he was not born and raised here in Cleveland. He was born in Puerto Rico um, with his other brothers and a sister. They were very close. I mean, they were raised in the same home. They were raised you know, by a single mom. Um, his mom, after she had divorced from my uncle, she never remarried. You know, she dedicated her life to raise her children. And they were close. Javier and Daniel Marti went to the same school as Ariel Castro. I've known him, I mean, you know, all throughout high school and junior high. 
his whole family. He's got a great family. I mean, the guy was just a regular Joe. I mean, he, he was outgoing, yeah. smart, very talented. Played a bass, played in bands. Uh, mm -hmm. He even played uh, softball every once in a while. He was always like into cars and everything, and. He loved his, his cars. Yeah, he had nice cars, bikes. He loved his cars. Yeah, he was just a regular kid. Ariel Castro moved into 2207 Seymour Avenue in 1992 with his wife and four children. He bought the house from his uncle and started living there with his wife. But soon things were going wrong. His neighbors, people who'd known him from school, remember it was a time of horrible domestic violence. He was a wife beater. He was a wife beater. He always yeah, he beat was. his wife. As you know, she used to run out of the house and stuff. And a couple of times she came over to use the phone to, to call the police. And But we never, I mean, never got into, because you don't get into matrimonial disputes. Court records show that Castro struggles to control his temper. He's been accused of attacking his former wife, who suffered broken ribs, a broken nose, desiccated shoulders, and a blood clot on the brain. However, she dropped the charges, and the only consequence for Castro seems to have been losing custody of their children. After he got a divorce, he he always kept to himself. Yeah, he was the quiet. Yeah, he was that. real quiet, kept to himself. Yeah. Like locked up, secluded in the house. Right. Nobody yeah. went to that house. No. We always found that strange, though. I mean, me and Mike's wife would talk about that, how that guy was weird. Neighbors say he was guarded about who could come in his home and that he only entered and exited through the back door. His mother would come to see him. He would check her out from the porch or come and talk to her. And he won't let her in the house. He never backyard. went inside the house. And never. you wouldn't stay too long in the backyard. He walk you out. He walk you, you out know, of the I backyard. I remember that day. We well, was drinking back there? Yeah, well, we had I mean, a couple of beers back there, but then after a minute, I mean, we had to come out. Castro was carefully concealing the prisoners held captive inside 2207 Seymour Avenue. To the outside world, he was living a normal life. During the day, he'd drive a school bus in Cleveland, a job he'd had for 22 years. At night, he played bass guitar in a salsa band. I've come to Belinda's nightclub in Cleveland to meet Tito and William. They've known Ariel Castro for 20 years and say he's one of the top bass guitarists they've played with. Oh my God, I can say about Ariel as a musician, one of the best musicians around. In this city, three bass players that are the best, and he was one of them. Did you feel that you knew him? Ariel was a person, he wanted to go dance. He would go and try to dance with somebody, and they would say no. Go back, say no. Go back, say no. And I would tell him, Ariel, come on, man. You can embarrass yourself. He said, no, I want to dance. And I was like, dude, if they don't want to dance with you, you can't force them to dance with you. I said, yeah, but still, look who I am. I'm a bass player. I'm on stage. I'm like, who cares? You can be Liberace. You can be the president. If they don't want to dance with you, you can't force them to dance with you. And were you friends outside of music as well? Yes, but not to a personal point where um, he kept his personal life very personal, if you will. Mm -hmm. He never talked about it. And us as musicians, you know, if somebody want to keep their personal life away from the business, we respect that. It's not a problem. So personal, his family say that he even kept his secrets from those closest to him, such as his two brothers, who were first arrested with Castro, but then released without charge. I keep hearing people say, how did these brothers not know that their brother was doing this? You, don't you visit your brother's home? I mean, he was a bachelor, so he lived alone. He probably made a lot of excuses. You know, oh, the house is a mess. Oh, don't, I, I don't have anything in my refrigerator. You know, I'm sure that's probably how he kept people away from the home. And we've been hearing that Ariel actually went out on some of the searches and took part in some of the vigils. Right. Why would you think he would do something like that, knowing that he was the person that had Gina? Um, 
the only thing that I can possibly assume is that perhaps he wanted to kind of have an inside track. Did they suspect something? Could they possibly know something? I have no way of knowing what went on in the mind of a person who is such a monster that he could look that mother in the face and ask her how she was and how she was doing. I just don't. I don't understand how he did any of what he did, but how do you look at that family and pretend like nothing is wrong and pretend like you're caring for them? That is so chilling. What were conditions like for Amanda, Gina and Michelle all those years? 2207 Seymour Avenue, seems pretty ordinary. Four bedrooms, one bathroom, a basement, no air conditioning. Details are starting to emerge of what happened inside. For the three women and young child who are trapped here, the house is both a prison and a torture chamber. This 3D model shows that it's always dark, with windows boarded up or covered. Inside, there are three floors and a basement. Castro lives on the ground floor. He locks all the rooms upstairs and locks the basement. And it's the basement where he first brings the women. It's small, dark and damp, with a low ceiling. He chains them to the wall. really hard for me to know what she had to go through for the last 10 or 12 years. It was a a living hell. They was chained to the walls, to the basement. Castro appears to treat the women differently, with Michelle Knight getting the worst punishment. The police assert that she was raped repeatedly and became pregnant several times. But every pregnancy was miscarried when Castro punched her in the stomach. It just really hurts me to think that he had turned around and beat her in the stomach just to have her miscarried so she couldn't have his kids. So have you thought about what Ariel Castro wanted Michelle for? Well, I think that he wanted her as a sex slave to do whatever, whatever he wanted her to do. That must make you angry. Yes, it does. It makes me very angry to know that a human being would do something like that to another human. She was just terrified for all their lives what he might do to them. So I guess that's why, in a way, that she had went along with what he said. Them and them two and her lived through living hell in that house. According to police and according to police reports, um, the, the house was kind of described as a prisoner of war camp. We were told that duct tape was used when he left, when Castro left the house for any length of time, he would duct tape their, their mouth. Um, so I, we know now that the outside front door was padlocked shut. We know that the bedroom doors were padlocked. We know that they were chained in the basement for some period of time, both from the ceiling and from the wall. We know that they were starved. We know that they were punched and beaten. They were really scared. They were scared of him. To them, he was a monster. And that's a monster they didn't want to deal with. So whatever he said, they did, you know? And that's the horrible thing about that, that I see that he had him out once in the garage. You know, I know he's got a big gate and he's got him, but scream. All three of you scream on top of your lungs. Too scared to scream, too terrified to scream. He manip manipulated them, you know, in such a way that he had full control over three women in the house. And while Gina de Jesus is locked up in the house, her father is visiting the neighbors just across the street. 
Jimmy's yeah. father, yeah. He came around a few times and uh, mm -hmm. I remember him coming over and talking. I, one time I talked to him and I, t I was telling him how sorry I felt. That girl was like 40 feet away from him and nobody knew nothing. Mm -hmm. You know? And they made a big hole back over here, down the block, oh, yeah. and looking for remains of them girls. Uh, and Amanda. I remember s sitting with Ariel, talking yeah. about that, how a person could do, you know, take these girls. And he would say, what, you know, what kind of a person would do that? And all the time, it was him, and he had them girls up there. You know what he did? He went and got the, the tape they put, the scene crime tape. He helped the police put up, I seen that with my own eyes, put up the crime scene tape around the street so people won't go over there, you know? When Gina de Jesus come up missing, he gave money so to to the to his her father or something. He made a donation so he, they could keep searching for her. And they had her, he had her all the time. As days become weeks, and then months, and years in that tiny dark space, the women probably lose track of time. They live on a diet of fast food, brought to them by their kidnapper. But the girls down the street commented that uh, they would see him with a big bag of big bags of McDonald's early in the morning. He ate McDonald's for 10 years. In later years, Castro allows them to live in separate rooms on the first floor, where slits were found cut into the doors, as if to allow food to be slid in and out. It appears the women come outside only twice during their decade in captivity. Wearing disguises, they take a short walk in the yard. Ricky Sanchez knew Castro for many years and went inside the house just days before the women escaped. When was the last time you came to the house? Last time I came here, it was the last Thursday before it happened. So that was the second? The second. Uh, and why did you go over? Uh, I mean, I came here because uh, we, well, we become friends on Facebook and he saw a bass uh, guitar that I, that I have, that I had it for sale. And he liked it pretty much and he wants me to come here and uh, show it to him. So. And then I spent about two hours in the house. The li a young girl came, she showed up from the back. And uh, he approached her, he grabbed, grabbed her by the, by the arm. And she asked her to, tell, to say hi to me. I said hi to her, but she never said hi to me. And then he said that that was his granddaughter. Was there anything else that you kind of noticed when you were in the house? There was some, some type of like noises that I hear. I don't really know exactly where the noises came from. And I, and I asked him, what is these noises coming from? And they said, he said that he had some dogs in the second level of the house, second floor. Knowing what you know now, knowing what you might have heard, what those noises might have been, how does that make you feel? When I heard the news at first, they came out on Monday, I couldn't even believe. But I went home and started looking at the news, really deep into the news. And uh, when I saw it was him, I saw the pictures, I could not believe I was just inside the house. The little girl Ricky spoke to is not Castro's granddaughter. She's his daughter, Jocelyn. On Christmas Day 2006, Amanda Berry, aged 20, gives birth to her in a paddling pool in the basement. Michelle Knight is put in charge of the delivery. She says Castro threatens to kill her if the baby dies. Michelle keeps the baby alive with mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. One of Castro's older daughters recalls seeing a picture. He showed me a picture that was in his cell phone, randomly, and he said, look at this cute little girl. It was a, a face shot, and I said, she's cute, who is that? You know, and he said, this is my girlfriend's child. And I said, Dad, that girl looks like Emily. Emily's my younger sister. And he said, no, that's, that's not my child. That's my girlfriend's child by somebody else. Cleveland, June 2008, the moment when the local police did catch up with Ariel Castro. Your driver's license. Excuse me? Your driver's license, please. What's wrong? First off, your plate's improperly displayed. It has to be displayed left or right. 
Arresting officer Jim Simone doesn't know it, but Castro has already kidnapped three girls and is holding them captive in his house. They have to be able to read them from behind. I stopped him on a traffic violation in uh, June of 2008. I just got, I just got it out, so... It's your motorcycle endorsement. Uh, that I don't have. And the other question is why you're riding it then? Sir, you don't have a helmet on, you don't have a license to operate it. And you subject yourself to being arrested, is that what you want? No, sir, I don't. I just stand by your bike, take out your insurance documents. He didn't have a license. He didn't have, uh, the plates were not belonged, did not belong to that particular motorcycle. Normally I would have arrested him had he given me any back talk, had he been flipping with me or made some remark. I just slipped the cuffs on him and took him to jail. Harry, we keep getting deeper, deeper, and deeper. I know, but I just got off of work. I'm a school bus driver, and I, I was going to get this all taken care of. I thought that was crazy. He mentioned the fact that he was a school bus driver. And I didn't want to take him to jail and have a possibly him losing his job because of a traffic violation. you got to get the plates changed over. you got to get all the things that are required by law. This is an arrestable violation. You could be going to jail over something silly, you know? So I didn't arrest him. I gave him a ticket and let him push the bike home. Because I did a check on him. All these cars are equipped with computers. I'm able to do a background check on anybody. And he only had a few traffic violations and no criminal background. So with that, I gave him the tickets and let him go. I made 10,000 arrests as a policeman. That's not traffic tickets. That's 10,000 people I put handcuffs on and threw in the back of his car and took him to jail. So it's, it, there are times when you're amazed how bad it gets. Jim has been a Cleveland cop for 38 years, 18 patrolling the 2nd District, which includes Seymour Avenue. I went past this house a thousand times. Nothing at that house drew my attention, even with the crime scene tape around it. It was just a house on Seymour. Yet in that house, there was a heinous crime being committed every second of every day for 10 years. But while police incompetence features highly in many of America's most notorious kidnap cases, the failure to find Castro and the Cleveland captives may be down to something else. The missing persons database kept by the Cleveland Police Department has over 100 names on it as of last week, with nearly half of them missing all year. When you look at this list of names, you get a sense of how swamped the police here are. Do they have the resources to cope? In the second district alone, which is where Castro's house is, 71 people are missing right now. The number of detectives assigned to work on cases of missing people is one. Do you feel like the police have done a good job? No, I think that they could have done a better job of what they were doing, especially for her. Do you feel there's enough resources at the police's disposal to, to successfully look for these kids to go missing? No. No, there's not. And because we, we handle a realm of things. It's not just the missing person. It's the auto theft. It's the burglary. It's the rape. It's the b and It's the shooting, the homicide. So in reality, you know, even though the chief may want to contradict me later on, we're stretched thin. You can't, you don't have the man, hour, man hours to invest in a major investigation because when I was a young policeman, it was about catching the bad guy. Today, it's how much is it going to cost us to catch the bad guy. And if it costs too much, then it's set aside. And what happens, they make the initial investigation, and then we wait. We wait for either the body to be found, or in this case, for some amazing rescue. Members of the community who still want to know what happened to her. Just two weeks before the amazing rescue, Local TV marks the 10th anniversary of Amanda Berry's disappearance. No one knows she's alive and in a house just a few miles away. Uh, the vigil just breaking up in the last, say, five minutes, and those who were in attendance today want everyone around here and everyone around the city to know it's never too late to do the right thing and no tip, no clue is too small. The clue is provided by Ariel Castro himself. He's gone out but hasn't chained up all of his captives. Finally, he's made a mistake. Was he good or what? <laughs> what kind of person would do something like that? You know, well, he slept. <laughs> Amanda Berry can see the front door open, though the outer storm door made of thin wire mesh is bolted shut. Often Castro will test his captives by leaving doors unlocked. He beats them if they try to get out. 
but because Amanda can see Aurora Marty on the neighbour's porch opposite, she goes for it. Help me, I'm Amanda Berry. You need police, fire, or ambulance? I need police. Okay, and what's going on there? I've been kidnapped and I've been missing for 10 years and I'm, I'm here, I'm free now. On a day that will long be remembered, Charles Ramsey's account of the breakout makes him an instant internet legend. See the sunlight to be Bro, around people. I knew something was wrong when a little pretty white girl ran into a black man's arms. Something is wrong here. Dead giveaway. From Seymour Avenue, ambulances rush Michelle, Amanda and Gina and the child to the local hospital. Gerald Maloney is the admitting doctor. You were in charge of their care for yes. you? Um, they came in by ambulance and there was also a lot of law enforcement officers, both local police and FBI, with them as well at that point. So it's fairly chaotic when everybody came in initially. There were a lot of people here. There was a lot of energy, good energy. So where were the girls taken immediately when they um, arrived? They were brought into the two rooms behind us. Would it be possible to have a look? Absolutely. Thank you. It's the first time any cameras have been allowed into the rooms where Amanda, Michelle and Gina were examined. We did a detailed exam, you know, we checked their head, neck, body, extremities, you know, looking for any injuries or any acute medical issues. Too often, unfortunately, we hear about an end to these stories, the end we hear is in people being found and being alive. It's usually, unfortunately, finding remains so it's we were very excited they were here they were alive and we we're very excited that we got to be the first safe harbor for them after they've been rescued nurse betsy martinez is a neighbor of the de jesus family and has a daughter the same age as gina she's on duty on may the 6th and is just about to have dinner when her boss breaks the news that will live with her forever they found the man, the Barry and Gina de Jesus, and I, I, I could not understand why I didn't believe it. Like, excuse, like who? I kept saying who. He kept saying the man, the Barry, Georgina de Jesus. I, I just, I was in, in awe about it. So I, he was like, I need somebody back there with them. So automatically, forget dinner. I'm on my way. He dropped my purse, ran back into the trauma base when I noticed Georgina and Amanda Barry walking in. It was a big deal to me because it was almost like hitting home. Mm -hmm. So I remember seeing Georgina, and I just hugged her and told her welcome home and, you know, started doing her, you know, try to do some nursing and try to get her vital signs and, you know, just, I, I was just in awe about it and I just kept, you know, staring at her and I couldn't believe that I was actually sitting next to her. And then to see Amanda Berry and her beautiful child and not knowing who the child was, I mean, it was a very, it was confusion, but it was, it was, I had to do my job first and stay professional as much as possible. But what I thought was professional was just to love them and just let them know that they were now safe and that it was going to be okay. And you were crying, you were happy, you were sad. You were, it wasn't even about what happened to them. It was just like, welcome home. We've been looking for you for a decade. What could I get for you? What could I do for you? It was just a, a very emotional and exciting day to have the pleasure to see her father and her mother and her sister walk in as far as Gina's family and to see them for that first moment. I mean, you got butterflies, you got the goosebumps, you know, you try to wipe your tears and try to stay professional, but it just couldn't help it. I mean, it was an amazing experience. How did the girls seem? They were still trying to get the surroundings. They were like, who are you? You know, so I made sure that everybody was introducing themselves so that they knew that these were workers here, that there were people that were going to, they're safe. I did notice that the girls wanted to be together. So every time we would like kind of separate them, they would come search for each other. Again, that's for sure. That they, they, they kept asking for the other one. Where's the other one at? And we had to let them know. They just run around the corner. They're, they're here. So you could tell that they had a bond. So you mentioned that you're from the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, what was the effect at the time? when the girls disappeared. You cannot go anywhere in Cleveland and not know Amanda Berry's name or Georgina. You cannot go anywhere in Cleveland. There were signs everywhere. Family never gave up. So it was to, I could not believe they were alive. I did not think that this, this doesn't happen. This is a miracle that I, I probably will never see again in my life. This does not happen. People do not come out alive out of this. So I kept, like, I couldn't, I just kept saying, I remember one time pinching Georgina and she's like, why did you do that? I'm like, because you're here. It's not a dream. This is not a dream. You know, like, it was that, that amazing. After 10 years of waiting, relatives and neighbours can finally celebrate. But there's also anger. Some, like Gina's uncle, struggle for control. I want to bust down and cry right now. But... Tears of relief? Yeah. 
And I don't know if you can print this or you can put this on the air, but if I got my hands on that guy. Amanda Berry had made the news for 10 years as a missing person. Now it's a different story. From a sister who dreamed of her coming home, a plea for privacy. I just want to say we are so happy to have Amanda and her daughter home. I want to thank the public and the media for their support and encourage over the years. And at this time, our family would request privacy so my sister and niece and I can have time to recover. Amanda learns that in 2006, three years after her kidnap, her mother had died. Luana Miller had never stopped fighting for her daughter to be found. Friends say she never recovered from Amanda's disappearance. Gina had been taken aged 14. She returns to her parents as a 23-year-old. Uh, we want to have a black party and close the streets down. <laughs> That's the best Mother Day present any mother could have. She gave a big thumbs up as she got out of the van. There she goes in the green. Michelle's condition is more serious. She leaves hospital five days later, but doesn't go home to her family. Instead, she goes to Gina's house. I've come to Gina's house, and it's actually very confusing. I don't really know how to feel. The banner suggests celebration. And yeah, is this a celebration? The police tape is a very stark reminder that something terrible has happened. The 14-year-old girl on that missing poster is gone. Who is she now? We know that Gina and Michelle are in that house. It's interesting that having been forced together for nearly nine years, Gina and Michelle are now choosing to be together. I assume because they've grown to rely upon one another. So I don't really feel comfortable staying here any longer because the both girls obviously want privacy and don't want cameras outside their house the whole time. I'm kind of looking at that tarpaulin and this is speculation but I assume that the last thing that either of them want is to be cooped up inside a house after being cooped up inside a house for so long. Um, so they've had to put the tarpaulin across the backyard so they can still maintain a degree of privacy. Michelle's grandmother is still waiting to see her. We was told that she didn't want to see us at all. So that kind of really hurt all of us to figure, you know, to just think that all these years that she didn't want to see us. So we was all kind of frustrated and crying and all this because if somebody would come up to you and say, well, your daughter or your granddaughter don't want to see you, it would kind of hurt you and break your heart, and that's kind of what it was doing to us. We thought kind of that she was blaming us for not giving her the attention like Amanda's and Gina's family did. Do you think that, from what you've seen of the press coverage, your family has been represented in a good light? Well, we heard that... Um, it was going around in there that, as a family, we was beating her, tormenting her, uh, we was abusing her. Um, we didn't care about her enough because we didn't look for her. That's not the truth. That's not the truth at all. So if he's found guilty, what punishment should Ariel Castro now face? Life in prison or the death penalty? 
The death penalty is on the statute in Ohio, and prosecutors say that they will press for it if it's found that Castro forcibly caused any of the women to miscarry. In Ohio, uh, a fetus has personhood. Uh, so as a person, that can be construed as murder. The uh, county prosecutor, Timothy McGinty, said he intends to pursue that uh, and see if the claims that uh, he forced miscarriages five times is true. I suppose medical testing uh, could, could, could figure that out in some fashion. Um, I'm certainly not a doctor, but yeah, a, a, a fetus is a person, has personhood in Ohio, therefore the murder charge. Uh, and if, uh, if a murder is committed in the commission of another crime, it would be aggravated murder, uh, and that would be the death penalty. For multiple murders, it's another aggravating circumstances. In that case, we have the death penalty in Ohio, and he could be executed. Talking about the death penalty, I, I, I think that's too easy for him. I think they should just make him suffer like he made them girls suffer. He needs to suffer. And the death penalty is way too easy. As far as it goes, if they give him the death sentence, the death penalty, that's fine. But I really like to see him get more out of it. That I like to really see him suffer as they had to suffer. Justice needs to be served here for sure. He never, he should never see the day of light again in his life. He'll never see the daylight again. Whatever he did to those girls, you can rest assured that while he's in the penitentiary, it's going to be very, very difficult for him because there's a hierarchy in the jail. The top of the list is the police killer. He's the number one guy. And it goes all the way down, and the bottom social rung in the jail are perverts and sexual deviants. Because even the murderers have mothers, sisters, and kids. No one wants to be in Ariel Castro's shoes right now. So what do you think should happen to Ariel Castro? You ask me as a policeman or as a father? Both. As a father, I have three daughters. Uh, I think that Ariel Castro should be brought out into the street and handcuffed to that telephone pole, and we go get the fathers of those three girls and give them Louisville sluggers and go, there he is, do what a father would do. As a police officer, uh, I'm bound by oath. There are things that you know you would love to do, that the person deserves it, but you can't do that. The county prosecutor is currently preparing the case against Ariel Castro. Right now, he's going to present evidence to a county grand jury, and by every indication, he's going to seek additional charges. He's looking at filing charges for every day each woman was kidnapped, every time that they were raped, and every time there was a lost pregnancy. Um, I don't believe there's a torture law in Ohio but there really doesn't need to be one for him to seek the death penalty. This is a very hard-nosed, aggressive prosecutor. He not only sounds tough, he is tough, and I think he'll seek the maximum penalty. But Ariel Castro's defense team has said that he intends to plead not guilty to all charges. I spoke with his attorneys. His attorneys told me that Castro has not confessed to any crime. In fact, the attorneys called him a regular guy who has a heart and who loves his child. I think that the uh, initial portrayal by the media has been one of a, quote, monster, and uh, that's not the impression that I got when I talked to him for three hours. This is the initial stages of the investigation uh, by the prosecutor's office as well as the defense, but it's to be expected that it will be a not guilty plea to all charges. For his victims, Michelle, Amanda and Gina, this will lengthen the legal proceedings. Meanwhile, his cousin Maria wants to convince them that the Castros are a good family. As a family, the Castros, we are so incredibly sorry that these horrible things happened to them at the hands of someone that is a part of our family, or was a part of our family. You know, I would love nothing more than for one day for these girls to be able to meet the rest of us in one of our family gatherings, one of our family reunions, and, and see the, the 
good people that are a part of this family, the happy people that are a part of this family, the people that are generous and kind and loving and, and I would love for them to experience that. I would love nothing more than to meet that little girl, Jocelyn. I mean, it's, it's been proven now that she is his child. That means she's our cousin. She's our blood. And I want her to know that she doesn't have monster in her blood. She has good, kind, generous, loving blood. If there's a positive message that survives this story, it is perhaps one of strength in the face of terrible circumstances. There's the incredible strength of the three women, Michelle, Amanda and Gina, who survived together, defied their captor and are now receiving the best psychological and medical care. Strength is also being displayed by the people of Cleveland. Their initial joy and relief was quickly overtaken by fear and guilt. I've heard people talk about being scared of their neighbours, feeling that they can't trust anyone. But now a new mood is detectable. People are talking about how to make changes to ensure that this never happens again. The phrase that I keep hearing is, we are our brother's keeper. <laughs>